Forest Hill Presbyterian Church, whether you're members, regular, visitors, everybody's welcome here. I look good to see you all. Just a couple quick announcements. Just a reminder of the book tables, both in the, we're going to call that the North X, and out here. You're free to take some books outside out in the North X to, to read, to give to other people if you want. Books in here you can uh, lease out almost like a library per se and, uh, and bring them back. But just remember they're there, the ladies' uh, gift cards uh, that they've made. And also the new devotional for this quarter is out on the table as well, the family devotional. And also, please, we've... We've lost, and this is very near and dear to Lori, the uh, junior church. Can we sent the email out, and we've asked people before. It's a large binder we use for junior church, and it's the one titled Show Them His Glory. We still haven't found that, so if you uh, know where it is, uh, let me know. Let us know and, and get it back to us. That'd be great. Or if you saw somebody take it, let me know. <laughs> and Lori will call them. <laughs> Yes, sir. Who's? They don't have volunteer police, don't they? Or you mean Harford instead of Baltimore County? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Stavros. We'll give you a call. Anyway, uh, so yeah, please. It's uh, it just disappeared several weeks ago, and we really, really want to find it. Okay, it's time now to start our worship service, and I'm going to read a little excerpt again from uh, What Happens When We Worship, excellent book. You've noticed, and we've talked about it a number of times, our food table. I'm sorry, I thought somebody said Tim. Uh, It is intentional. There's a purpose to our food table. It's not just uh, because we like to eat, which we do, and that's good as well, Uh, but there's a purpose to the table. So listen to uh, the words from this book. Learn to linger. We have seen from Acts 2.42 that the early church not only devoted themselves to preaching, praying, and the sacraments, but also to the fellowship of the saints. Sunday is a day for community, the community of faith. It can be easily to it can be easy to attend church, much like one might attend a movie. We grab our seats and scroll through our phones or chat with our buddies while we wait for the service to begin and sit dutifully during the show. But then once we hear the benediction, which is the cinematic equivalent of a rolling credit, we gather our things and head straight for the car. If this looks like something that you typical for your Sundays, if this is your habit, then dear friend, your experience of the blessing of God's day and God's people is lamentably incomplete. Staying just a few minutes after the service could be the simple change that will revolutionize your church-going experience, says Pastor Whitney Clayton. In his experience, the people who regularly put this into practice make stronger friendships and inevitably find ways to serve. So don't zip on home immediately after the service. Stick around. Love your neighbors by asking about their lives. Get to know our community here, our brothers and sisters. Look outside of yourself and your situation by finding ways to serve each other. Prepare for Sunday by readying yourself, readying your family and your schedule to hang around a few minutes afterwards. Let's stand now as we hear God's call to worship. This will be taken from his word. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 5. This is God's word. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. 
Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, you indeed are our Lord and our God. You are the only protector of our souls. We will not be put to shame, but we will be lifted up in Christ into eternal glory. Make us to know your ways this morning. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. Teach us to wait with patience, trust, and hope all the day long. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our response in praise by singing, Lead On, O King Eternal, hymn number 580. jumped the bulletin a little bit, didn't I? We're going to continue reading from Psalm 25, 6 through 11, as we hear God's call to us to confess our sins. 6 through 11. Remember your mercy, O Lord. Remember your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt for it is great. Our dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge before you and each other that yes, our sins are great. Father, even our, what we would consider harmless or small sins is still a violation of your law. It is a sin against you, our God, and it cannot be excused. 
apart from the blood of our Savior. Father, you have in Christ forgiven our sins, past, present, and future. Work on our hearts. Father, show us your paths, your truths. Make sin offensive to us. Make us more like your heart, the heart of Jesus. May our desire be to do away with the old man, to put him aside, and to seek and become more like Jesus. And by your spirit, that will happen. And for that, we will be eternally grateful, our dear Father. And we ask this and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's hear now God's assurance of his pardon and forgiveness. Psalm 25, verses 12 through 20. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him he will instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God. Redeem us, your people, out of all our troubles. Let's stand and let's give thanks for God's work on our behalf, our Christ, and sing Man of Sorrows, what a name, hymn number 246.
standing and turn now to page 846 in the rear of the red hymnal and we will confess our faith by reading together the Apostles Creed 845 <coughs> Christian what do you believe I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of the heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we get ready to uh, pray on the behalf of each other, our body here, um, I want to just remind you that we will finish with the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I believe you've seen your email about uh, Pastor Osale, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. He still remains in jail, but they're actively, thankfully, working on getting him out. So uh, let's try to remember him in our prayers. We have Jason's surgery. Uh, next, uh, no, this Monday, tomorrow, and Megan's delivery on Tuesday. So um, let's just remember uh, both the somber, uh, nervous things that we go through in our daily lives, as well as the joyful events, as we think about in prayer for people uh, that we, we dearly love. So let's go to prayer now. We will finish with the Lord's Prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, you have called each and every one of us here together this morning for the very intentional, specific purpose of worshiping you, our Savior, our Redeemer. You have brought us each here to see each other's faces. Father, to take the time to ask how our brothers and sisters are doing to inquire on what the week ahead looks like for each other. Father, may we be willing and desiring to think of others more highly than ourselves, to be willing to sacrifice our time, to give up our time at a moment's notice because you are the one who has changed it. May we not grumble and complain because that is before the face of the God of the universe. Father, we prayed and read this morning that you would direct our paths. You do. We pray that you will train us up, train our hearts to give up to realize that it is you that is directing our paths, our day. May we joyfully, and Father, that is so hard. Sometimes it's just downright impossible. May we joyfully serve others. Father, I look around at your people, and we see those that are facing surgeries that are facing health issues and concerns, those that are ready to give birth 
to little covenant children. And what does that mean to raise up your children in your admonition to trust you to one day become your children, to name the name of Christ as their own? Prepare us, Father, for the work that you have given us before the foundation of time itself. We need your help. We ask for your help. We ask for wisdom. And Father, we ask this according to your will because you promise us that you will give us wisdom. You promise us that you will complete the work you have given us to do. You will enable us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work you do in each and every one of us. We would be lost. We would be dead. We would be condemned to hell itself if it were not for the work you do in our hearts. Make us thankful and joyful, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I forgot, didn't I? You were supposed to remind me. Let's, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This prayer is very much a promise to us as well. We can pray this with complete and utter confidence that God is going to honor this prayer. I will now call the ushers forward to collect our tithes and offerings. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together now and sing the doxology, page 731. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures
continue standing and let's sing, Then, Lord, shall I fully know. And the words are in the middle of your bulletin. Amen. Turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. We're looking at the second commandment, which we find in verses 4 through 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is God's holy word. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands 
of those who love me and keep my commandments. Father, your word is truth. You alone have the words of eternal life. Please speak your word to our hearts and write it there that we might receive your word by faith, treasure it up in love for you, and respond to it in obedience. Show us Christ. Draw our hearts to him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> One brief note, and that is that we're, we're going to be covering the commandment itself today, but the reason that God gives for the commandment, which starts halfway through verse 5 with, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity. That part, the reason, we're going to actually save that for next week, and we're going to include that in our look at the third commandment um, of not taking the name of the Lord our God in vain. So we're going to just cover the commandment itself this week, and then the reason for the commandment will be covered with, with the third commandment, uh, Lord willing, next week. So, marriage, wedding vows. Think about your wedding vows much? It's one of the good things about going to a wedding. It's always good. It's always good for married couples to go to weddings because it reminds us of the vows that we made and of the commitment that we've made. It reminds us of what marriage is all about. It's also always good for all living people to go to funerals because uh, it reminds us of where we're heading. And... Uh, causes us to have perspective. Anyway, when people get married, they take vows, and the vows go something like this. Um, I, Jason, take you, Beth, to be my wedded wife, and I do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband, to love, honor, and cherish you in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, as long as we both shall live. Um, in these vows, we're clarifying two things that are so important. We're clarifying a who, and we're clarifying a how. So the first thing we do is clarify the who. I, Jason, take you, Beth, to be my wedded wife. So this is the who. I'm making a commitment, an exclusive commitment to you and to you alone. I'm not taking others. I'm only taking you. And then there's the how. What does it mean? How am I going to do this? Well, I promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your faithful, loving and faithful husband, to love, honor, and cherish you in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, as long as we both shall live. So that's the how. How am I going to take you as my wedded wife? I'm going to love, honor, and cherish you. I'm going to do that in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, as long as we both shall live. So that's important. It's important to clarify both the who and the how. And that's really what we have in the first two of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment tells us who we are to worship. Uh, you really need the, the introduction to the Ten Commandments to get that. It's the Lord our God who delivered us and no other gods. So we worship the Lord and the Lord alone and no other gods. But then how are we to worship God? The most culturally prominent, culturally relevant, easy to relate to, understandable way for anyone in the ancient world to worship any god was through an idol, through a statue, through a carved image. And so God says, no. God says, just as he says, no other gods, to emphasize we worship only him, he says, no carved images, to emphasize how we are to worship him, which Jesus later uh, clarifies as being in spirit and in truth. So God cares both who we worship, and how we worship. Um, now, the Roman Catholic Church and some others don't actually see these as the first two commandments. 
Rather, they see all of this as being just the first commandment from verse 3 to verse 6. If you do a little YouTube search for second commandment, what you'll find is that Protestant sources are talking about don't make a carved image and don't bow down before it, and Catholic sources are saying don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In fact, if you go out this direction of the building, there's a copy of the Ten Commandments facing the road, go look at it. It won't have the second commandment being this. It'll have the second commandment being not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, then how do they have Ten Commandments? Well, to have Ten Commandments, they then split the Tenth Commandment. The Tenth Commandment says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. It's a commandment against coveting. They take that and split it, and they say the Ninth Commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, which is just a house, and then the Tenth Commandment is all the other stuff. Why do they do that? Because they teach that the issue of making statuary for worship is only about other gods that you might worship. So they say, you don't want to worship other gods. And so don't make any statues of any likeness of anything in heaven or earth or under the earth, and don't bow down to it or serve it as in the worship of other gods. But that's not what God is saying here. They have interpreted this command too narrowly. They have seen it as only an issue of false gods, but that's not true. And when you, when you sort of fold it up into the first commandment and you only see it as the worship of other gods, you miss a very important biblical principle which we find throughout Scripture, and that is that God does care how we worship him, and we are to worship him rightly. And God repeatedly, throughout the Old Testament especially, condemns his people for worshiping him through carved images. The very first example we see of this comes right after God gives the Ten Commandments to his people. Moses goes up on the mountain, and the people wonder where he's gone, because he's gone for 40 days. And in Exodus 32, we read this. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up! Make us gods who will go before us. As for this man, Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned, with, fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. He even uses the word a graving tool, which is the same word as graven image. Um, and they said, they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord, to Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, which is a euphemism for very bad behavior. So... The people asked Aaron, because he's the high priest, he's been leading them in worship. The people asked Aaron, make us some gods. We need something we can see. We're visual learners. We have to have something to look at. Make us gods, right? And so Aaron says, okay. The voice of the mob is not one to be resisted lightly, because you might end up, you know, non-living. So he gives in to the voice of the mob, and he takes the gold earrings, and he makes the golden calf, and he sets it up. And the people start saying, these are the gods who brought us out of the land of Egypt. And I think Aaron at that moment is like, I don't want them to be drawn away from Yahweh. I want them to know that Yahweh is the God who brought them out of Egypt. So he puts an altar in front of this golden calf, and he says, tomorrow is going to be a feast to Yahweh, to the Lord. And they get up the next day, and before the golden calf, they worship Yahweh the Lord, but they're doing so through a golden calf, and their day begins 
in sacrifice and offering. And those of you who are following along in Leviticus, it'll be a familiar pattern to you. But it ends with pagan revelry. They had paganized their worship, and very soon their behavior was paganized too. In Leviticus 10, which was yesterday's reading and devotional passage, we had Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's oldest sons, and they offered strange fire in the presence of the Lord. They didn't make a carved image. They didn't make a graven image, but they thought they could come into the presence of the Lord with their own formula for incense. Maybe they got tired of smelling the same smell every day. Some of you in your home have these like diffusers that put aromas into the air or, or candles. We've got candles at our house and you know, you get tired of the same scent and you want to mix it up a little bit. I mean, worship that's the same can get kind of boring. So they bring in strange fire, a new formula for incense, and God strikes them dead. That's how seriously God takes his worship. Now, if that bothers you that God struck them dead for offering strange fire, I really encourage you to go and listen to yesterday's devotional on Leviticus 10 because I spell it out a little bit more. But the point is that God is holy and he cares about how his people worship him as well as that his people worship him. Many years later, when the northern tribes of Israel rebelled against the house of David and they left to form the separate kingdom of Israel, their first king, Jeroboam, had a problem on his hands. He wanted to keep people worshiping Yahweh, but he didn't want people going to Jerusalem to do it because Jerusalem is where the throne of David's house was, and he didn't want his people drawn after loyalty to David's house. So he says, um, golden calf, that sounds like a great idea. In fact, let's do two of them this time. I guess one wasn't enough for him. So he puts one in Bethel, and he puts one in Dan, kind of at the two sides of his kingdom, and he's making, he's making worship more convenient. You don't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem. You don't have to hike all the way up that steep mountain. You don't have to go into that place where the Davidic kings are. You can just come right here, and look, beautiful golden calf. If this one's too far away, I put another one up there. We'll make worship convenient and culturally relevant to you. And they... And God says, no. God curses the altars. He curses the golden calves. He curses the nation of Israel who persisted in that sin for generation after generation. So God regulates how we are to worship him. This is a New Testament truth too. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Our worship must be both spiritual, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and from our spirits, from our hearts with sincerity, and it must be in conformity to God's word, the truth. In Reformed circles, we call our conviction about worship the regulative principle for worship. And the regular principle simply means that God's word and God's word alone regulates what we do in worship. So we are only authorized to do the things that God has commanded or God has set the precedent in his word for us to do in worship. What do we do in worship? What does God's word tell us of New Testament worship? We don't offer animal sacrifices. We don't burn incense. We're in the new covenant age where the law of Moses has been fulfilled in Christ. And so our worship is simpler and more spiritual. But the elements of worship that are given to us in scripture are these. The public reading and preaching of the word. Prayer. The singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Along with the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Simple. Read the Bible. Preach the Bible. Sing pray. Observe the sacraments. We also take up an offering, and from time to time, we will have oaths and vows. So the sacraments are the Lord's Supper and baptism. Today, we are observing the Lord's Supper. Next Lord's Day, Lord willing, we will be baptizing little Mackenzie King. So we'll have a baptism next week. And then we take oaths and vows when someone joins the church, like Corinne did last week or when officers are ordained and installed, as Lord willing, we're hoping to do that in July. Um, And so this is what God has commanded us to do. And then the structure of worship, biblically, is a covenant dialogue between God and his people. We're meeting with God. 
This is not a show that you're coming to watch. I love that with Tim right at the beginning. Like, it's not a movie. We don't show up, you know. It's not like the announcements are kind of the previews, or some people think, well, the announcements and the call to worship and the opening singing, that's just kind of previews. You show up sometime during the previews and you're okay. And then the credits roll with the benediction, we walk out the door. Notice we don't, we don't dim the lights, we don't put up stage lights. Um, it's not just because we're in a rented facility. Lord willing, when we get our own church building, if God blesses us with that, uh, we're not going to have stage lights that, you know, and we're not gonna bring the house lights down and bring up the stage lights and start up the smoke machines because it's not a show. We are meeting with God. We are worshiping God as his people. He's speaking to us, we're speaking to him. He's calling us, we're praising him. He's giving us his law, we're confessing our sins. He's giving us assurance of forgiveness, we're giving thanks to him. It's a dialogue between God and his people. And it's important that we do that. It's not entertainment, it's not just information, it is a meeting between God and his people. So we don't add extra things to the worship service. Um, we do what God commands us to do. Now, I mentioned earlier that the Roman Catholic Church takes the commandment too narrowly, thinking it only forbids the making of false gods. The Eastern Orthodox Church also takes this commandment too narrowly. They do so in a slightly different way. They see it as a commandment against making carved images Right? The language here is carved image or a graven image. And so their interpretation is you don't make statuary, you don't make 3D representations, but you can have a flat icon. So as long as it's a flat picture, then you can bow down and you can venerate as long as it's not a statue. Um, that's not right. Now some people take the commandment too broadly as if God is forbidding all representative artwork. After all, verse four says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. That's the part that rules out the flat icons. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. They take verse four, they take it out of context, they take it as an absolute and they say, that's it. No representative images of anything. And this is why uh, groups as diverse as Muslims and the Amish will not do any representational art. Uh, it's part of the reason why Amish don't want you taking their picture either, because it's you're trying to make an image and they don't want that, it's no images. But the context clearly within the Ten Commandments is talking about images related to worship. It's not talking about painting a portrait of somebody or painting pictures of animals, or, or, other, or, represent, or representation of other things that are not things be, being worshipped. And we know this because God himself, who gives this commandment, right after he gives the Ten Commandments, what does he give to Moses? Instructions for the tabernacle, right? What's at the center of the tabernacle? The very footstool of God is the Ark of the Covenant. What's above the Ark of the Covenant? Two cherubim with their wings outstretched. Oh, wait a minute, I thought we weren't supposed to have any carved images. Well, it's not, they're not representing God, and they're not worshiping them. They're representing the angelic beings who are around the throne of God, and it's a picture, it's a representation of the mercy of God uh, and his presence with his people. And in fact, on the veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place, there's woven into the veil cherubim, and pomegranate. So we know God's not saying no representative artwork whatsoever, but he is saying basically stay away from the golden calf type thing. Stay away from making an image to be representative of God for use in worship, or really just stay away from making any kind of representative image of God at all, whether it looks like a heavenly being or an earthly being, and then saying this is God, and you either bow down and worship it or you think it is an accurate representation of God. In Deuteronomy 4, God, uh, God through Moses warns the people, he says, therefore watch yourselves very carefully 
He's, he's calling to mind that day when God spoke the Ten Commandments to them from Mount Sinai. He says, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. So God doesn't want us to take him and reduce him to an image. That was the big distinction between Israel and all the surrounding cultures. Um, all of their temples had statues of their gods in the middle, and the tabernacle and the temple in Israel had a box. And inside the box was the Ten Commandments written by the hand of God. It's the word of God that was in the middle, in the heart of the heart of the temple, and the tabernacle was the word of God. And that's a big, big difference. You didn't, you didn't see God, but you what? You heard him speak. So you didn't see a form, but you heard a word. So it's the word and not the image that's central. And so don't try to make an image of God. Images are, by nature, reductionistic. Whenever we try to make any image of God, we are, we are limiting him in some way, tr trying to define him down, even control him, by making him what we want him to be, rather than what he is. And I do believe that the prohibition against making images of God includes making images of Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus is man as well as God. We know that he was a real person and that he did appear in human flesh and that people saw him. We do know that Thomas bowed down and worshipped him after the resurrection, saying, my Lord and my God. But we don't have any pictures of Jesus. And we don't have any physical descriptions of Jesus given in the Gospels. Read all four Gospels. That's one of the striking things. There's never once given to us a physical description of Jesus. Even in Revelation, when John sees visions that represent Christ, they are clearly symbolic in nature, and they're communicating truth about who Jesus is and about what he does. They're not meant to say this is what he looks like. So making an image, because Jesus is one we worship, it's inaccurate at best and very distorted at worst. Uh, the most common image that we see, of course, is of Jesus as a long-haired, blue-eyed white guy, and he almost certainly wasn't that. Um, so we should stay away from images because God's told us to stay away from images. In fact, after Moses gives the Ten Commandments again in Deuteronomy, uh, he says, these words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. So God spoke, and God wrote, and God gave what was written, and the people kept what was written treasured. That's the pattern for worship. It is a word-centered worship. When Moses asked to see God's glory, he says, show me your glory. God says, no one can see my glory and live, so I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you, and then I will proclaim to you the name of the Lord. And so Moses was covered in the cleft of the rock while the glory of God passed by, but then God spoke his name, his character, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He spoke about who he was rather than showing and that's so important. Images. We say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm. I'm not denigrating images. They certainly are powerful. Uh, yesterday, Andrew graduated from high school. And, you know, part of what they do during the graduation is show the slideshow of pictures of their life. And I already knew I was in trouble just because, you know. But someone <clears throat> decided to put an image 
in the slideshow of Andrew at about two or three years old sitting on his papa's knee, uh, Beth's dad, who went to be with the Lord uh, almost 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, I was done for by that point on. Anybody who was there can tell you I was just kind of a blubbering mess. But um, So images certainly do capture a moment. They do communicate. But they don't, they don't help us to think clearly about what is and what isn't. They're subjective. Uh, think about the Mona Lisa. Very famously, she got a pie thrown in her face recently. Um, I don't know if you saw that, but people are always trying to attack the Mona Lisa. That's why they have it covered in glass. But think about the Mona Lisa. Like for hundreds of years, people have been wondering what her ambiguous smile means, right? What is, why, why is she smiling like that? What is she trying to communicate? And because she's silent, we'll never know for sure, will we? We just keep guessing. Well, the good thing is we don't have to guess about God. God is not silent. And we should rejoice in the fact that God is not silent, and we should realize that if he speaks to us, that is so much better than just showing us a bunch of pictures. It communicates who he is. He communicates his grace powerfully as we trust in Jesus and we seek him. When in John 6, when Jesus had spoken some very hard words to his disciples and to the crowds that were gathered about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, a lot of the crowds were offended and they left. Jesus clarified to his, to his disciples, the words that I'm speaking to you are not flesh, but they're spirit and life. And then he asked them, are you going to go away too? And Peter says, Lord, where else shall we go? You have the cool pictures we want to see. No, he said, you alone have the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. Now, God has given us things whereby he communicates himself to us in ways that are more than verbal and also more than visual. He's given us multi-sensory experiences that communicate his grace powerfully as we're trusting in Jesus and we're, and we're seeking him through these. And of course, I'm talking about the sacraments. In, in a few moments, we will share in the Lord's table. We will see, we will touch, we will smell, we will taste bread and wine. And we will know, <laughs> we will know that the bread and the wine are not actually the body and blood of Jesus but they will communicate to us in a way that does go beyond words how much God loves us, how much Christ has done for us, how much we need Christ, and how much our souls are to be fed by Christ and are to be cleansed by Christ. And next week, Lord willing, we'll see in baptism a picture, and Mackenzie will feel that <laughs> symbol. <laughs> um, and it will show us that God renews us and cleanses us when he unites us to Christ by his spirit. So these, these are things that we can seek if we say, well, the word is good and I love the word, but I want something more than the word. God has actually given us something more than the word, something more than images. He's given us his sacraments, which are an aid and a means of grace. But you see, God's given us more than his word, but not less than his word. And an image is actually less. And it would be robbing us of importance. So what is God seeking from us in worship? We've talked about what we shouldn't be doing. What should we be doing in worship? Well, we touched on it earlier when I read from John 4. Jesus said, the Father seeking people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. John Calvin understood this to mean that more than anything else, God wants our hearts without hypocrisy, deception, or mere formalism. So Calvin's motto for his worship became, I offer you my heart, Lord, promptly and sincerely. I offer you my heart. We can get all the forms and content of worship just right. We can avoid all the things we're not supposed to do and we can feel very proud of ourselves for getting it right. We have dotted every I, we have crossed every T, we are reformed, we follow the regulative principle, we've got everything lined up and buttoned up just right. 
and we're still not worshiping God rightly. If you are married and you've taken those marriage vows, maybe you got good advice about how to have a healthy marriage. You should communicate regularly. You should serve one another, right? You should do all these things. You should be faithful. And so you do all these things, right? Let's say you just say, I'm, I'm going to do all the things I'm supposed to do to do the, the marriage things I'm supposed to do, right? So I get up in the morning and, you know, I make coffee and I make Beth her cup of coffee and, you know, hug, kiss, check, right? And special occasions, you know, gifts, flowers, date nights, check. Pray together, check. We're going to do all the things, right? But your heart wasn't in it. You didn't love. You were just doing to do the doing. Would that be a good marriage? No. It wouldn't be. And God doesn't want that from us either. He doesn't want us to show up properly dressed, properly doing all of the doings, but our hearts, our minds, our spirits far from him. He rebuked his people through the prophet Isaiah and said, you know, his people draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So we must come engaged in worship. We must come loving God. That does mean we need to pay attention. We need to try to be well-rested the night before. You should eat some breakfast before you come if you can. You know, if you're me, you need a couple cups of coffee in you so you can be attentive and focused, right? There's practical things, but all the practical things, too, it's about bringing our hearts to the Lord. And that means, listen, that means you have to be spiritually alive if you're going to worship God rightly. God's grace has to bring you from death to life. If you don't truly know the Lord, if you've not come to know the love of God, if you've not had your sins forgiven in Christ, if you've not been united to Christ by the Holy Spirit, by trusting in him, then you cannot rightly worship. You can come and go through the motions. You can look good from the outside, but you can't rightly worship. You can come and sing and read, but your heart doesn't belong to the Lord. You can't offer it to him promptly and sincerely. So you must trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You must receive his love. You must know eternal life through Christ. And then you can worship. Worship. The Greek word for worship that Jesus uses in his dialogue with the woman that's used as the most common way of talking about worship in the New Testament is the word proskuneo that literally means kiss toward, to kiss toward. And I looked up, not on Blue Letter Bible, which is an online free website that I recommend, they have some language tools in there, and I was looking at their explanations of proskuneo, and, and, and the root word, kiss, they said, to kiss toward, it's like when a dog wants to reach up and kiss you in the face. I thought, that's a pretty good image. You know, it's a pretty good image. You know, our, our little dog, Hazel, if you come over to visit, he might not like you very much. Just warning you. But he loves us. He loves his family. And he is so super excited to see us whenever we walk in the door. And if you have a dog, you know that, right? He, He's one who does the full body tail wag. You know, he doesn't just wag his tail, but he's going back and forth. And he can't wait to get on us. And he really, what he really wants to do is he wants to get up on you and lick you in the face. Now, we don't really let him do that, but that's his heart's desire. His burning heart's desire is, I love you. I'm so happy to see you. You're the best thing in the world. You're my everything. Let me get as close to you as I possibly can. And that's the idea. It's maybe a silly illustration, but that's the idea that we should have with God is, God is wonderful. God is our source of life. He's our everything. You know, our dogs love us because we give them everything, and, and, and we're theirs, and, and they're ours. But that's so much more true of God. He's given us literally everything, and we are his, and he is ours, and we should just want to be with him and to give him our hearts and to be loyal to him. The reason why, if you come over to our house, Hazel is going to treat you with skepticism is because he loves his family and he's loyal and he wants to protect his family. There's this loyalty. We'll talk about that when we get into jealous God next week, but to worship God is to give him our hearts 
promptly and sincerely. It's to want him above all else. It's to be loyal to him above all else. It's to care more about him than we care about anything else. One more brief point on worship, and that is that Paul tells us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship. That means that worship is more than just what we do on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is important, but worship is more than that. It's not less than that, but it's more than that. What we do out of love for God and in obedience to God every day and in every situation of life is part of our worship. Now, you have to be clear about this, what this means and what this doesn't mean. Within reform circles in recent years, there's been an emphasis on this truth that all of life is worship, and that's true, should be. But like all biblical truths, you can take it out of context and you can take it to an unbiblical extreme. And what some people have done is they've said this. Well, if everything is worship, if all of life is worship, then I can worship God on the golf course on Sunday morning. You know, I'm hitting those drives, and I'm putting those, and I'm praising the Lord for the beauty of his creation, and that's my, that's my Sunday morning worship. No. You don't take a biblical truth and use it as an excuse to overrule or get out of another biblical truth, right? Or, or some people say that if everything is worship, then anything that's lawful for us to do should be permitted in worship. So if it's not sinful, why would we ban it from worship? It's very interesting the kinds of things people want to add to a worship service. Just a little side note. You know, it's the whole thing with carved images, I think I emphasized this already, is that, that that's what was culturally relevant. That's what was culturally dominant in the ancient world. You have to have an idol. You have to have a statue. Otherwise, what are you doing, right? And when people say, well, if it's lawful for us to do, we ought to be able to do it in the worship service. What they generally mean is we can make the worship service more entertaining. We can make it more of a show because that'll, that'll bring people in and that'll keep people engaged. They don't generally mean, you know, we can have a pottery class in the worship service or, you know, whatever. Um, and so we need, to, we need to be careful. We check our hearts say, if I'm looking for more, and this is, this is where we all, we all need to check ourselves, if I'm looking for more from the worship service, is the real problem the fact that I didn't come bringing my heart promptly and sincerely to the Lord? Is, is the real truth that I need to be offering God more in worship? that I come just wanting to go through the motions and not wanting to give God my heart. So if you're not, if you're trying to get more out of the worship service, maybe it's because you're not giving God the worship that he is worthy of receiving. God has promised us that our gathered worship on the Lord's day is special. Yes, he's always with us, and yes, all of life is worship, but Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day of resurrection. This is the day of new creation. This is the way, this is the day of promises fulfilled, of hope alive forevermore. And so when we gather on this day, if we worship from the heart for the glory of God, seeking Christ then we are blessed in a way that's not true of anything else we do in the rest of our lives. So our highest goal and our deepest engagement should be here with God's people for worship on the Lord's day. Not trying to be culturally relevant, but trying to be God's and God's alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have made us your own. It is by your grace that we know you. It is by your grace that we can call out to you and be saved by you. It is by your grace that we are drawn by your spirit to worship you. It's all your work. 
Salvation belongs to the Lord from beginning to end. Worship is a gift and a blessing from you. So, Father, draw our hearts. May we offer them promptly and sincerely in gratitude for all that you've done in response to your work of grace, in joyful praise because of how good and how great you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to respond to God's word by singing praise from the heart. Hymn number 469, How Sweet and Awesome is the Place. You may be seated. As we come to the Lord's table, we want to hear what God says about how it is that we rightly benefit, rightly are enriched by what he is offering us here, which is his son in sacramental form. And in 1 Corinthians 10, we read this about the Exodus generation. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, 
and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, but they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples to us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's that passage we just read. Why did they do that? Why did they do that? Well, for that, we get a little more information from Hebrews chapter 4, where we read this. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. But good news came to us just as to them. He's talking about the Exodus generation too. Just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. The fruit was that they engaged in paganized worship and in pagan revelry. But the root problem was that they didn't believe God's promises. The promises they were given, same gospel promises were given just in, you know, shadow form. <laughs> they didn't take those promises and unite them to themselves by faith. They didn't believe. And so when Paul warns us in the very next chapter in 1 Corinthians 11, when he talks about the Lord's Supper, he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Just as in the Exodus generation, they all ate the bread from heaven, which Jesus told us was an image of his body, the true bread from heaven. They all drank from the rock, which was Christ. But most of them God wasn't pleased with because they didn't, they didn't believe. So also, on the night Jesus was betrayed, there were 12 men around the table. And there was one who did not benefit at all from what he ate and drank from the Lord's hands because he didn't believe. And he'd rather have silver than his Lord. So for us, that's what the call is. The call is, do you believe? Do you trust in Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior? It, are you looking for him through these means of grace? Are you saying, Jesus, you alone are the bread of life that satisfies my hungry soul. Oh, how hungry my soul is, and nothing in this world can satisfy, but you alone, O oh Lord, are the satisfaction for which my soul craves and longs. Are you saying to him, Lord Jesus, your blood alone is the forgiveness of all of my sin. I can't atone for my own sin, but you've already paid for all of my sins with your precious blood, and in your blood alone I am fully forgiven. If you have faith and if you're looking to Jesus, then Jesus will feed you with himself here, and you will be blessed and you will benefit. But if you don't believe, don't partake because it would be worse than a waste of time. You'd actually be eating and drinking judgment to yourself because you'd be saying, okay, I heard all that stuff about Jesus being the bread of life, but I don't really believe it, but I'm going to go through the motions of pretend anyway. 
okay, I heard all that stuff about the blood of Jesus forgiving my sins, but I don't really believe it, but I'm going to go through the motions anyway. Don't do that. Instead, pray, Lord, I need to believe. Would you give me the gift of faith so that I can really believe in Jesus and not just be going through the motions? So, this is not the table of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church or the PCA. It's the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is the host and is the feast. Just as he is both high priest and sacrifice, at his table he is the host who invites us, and he is the meal that we eat. And he says to you, if you believe in my name, if you've confessed my name before others, then come and take and eat. But if you don't believe in me, if you've not confessed that faith before others, then don't eat, but pray and wait on the Lord. The night that he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat. We'll hold the bread and partake together as a sign of our unity in Christ. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread will hunger again, but whoever eats of the bread I give will never hunger. The bread which I give is my body, which I offer for the life of the world. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The body of Christ was given for you. Take and eat.
Lord Jesus, we thank you that because of your finished work on the cross and your victorious resurrection, the bread is very sweet indeed. We rejoice that you are our perfect righteousness and our peace. You are our eternal life. Cause our hearts to hope and trust in you always. Strengthen us with yourself, we pray. Amen. Amen. In the same way, after supper, our Lord took the cup. And giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, all of you. You'll find wine in the clear cups, grape juice in the purple tinted cups, and again, we'll hold and partake together as a sign of our unity in Christ. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. What we earn from our sin is death. And the life is in the blood, and so the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. So when Christ came into the world, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Take and drink. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have made full atonement for all of our sins with your precious blood. That we are freely and fully forgiven 
not by what our hands have done, but by what was finished on the cross by you. We rest in you alone. Amen. Now we'll respond to the Lord's table by singing, It Was Finished Upon That Cross. You'll find those words in your bulletin. Let's stand and sing together. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.